Board of Education will reconvene at this time. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. Everybody's waiting for the big snowstorm. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Thank you for coming this evening. Is there a motion uh, to approve the agenda? I move approval of the agenda as presented with the removal of recognitions from this meeting um, and ask that those be placed on another agenda. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second it. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. The ayes have it. All right. Moving along uh, for the purposes of time and the weather, board members, uh, please give your board reports to the secretary so uh, they will be included uh, on the record for this evening's meeting. So we'll just move on along with next it would be the uh, superintendent's report. Dr. Moderano. Okay, I will try to move through this as quickly as I can recognizing the uh, concerns this evening. Uh, my first topic this evening has to do with snow. <laughs> and uh, inclement weather and so I'm going to bring the community up to speed on this and I had great intentions of putting out a press release uh, regarding where we were and plans that we were going to advance to the board uh, but that has been uh, pulled at the last minute because of the possible events that are going to uh, appear in our county this evening which would cause some adjustments for tomorrow as well now I'm not saying that that's going to occur tomorrow uh, for, for those students who are in the <laughs> audience who are smiling back at me greatly uh, but uh, let me just bring you up to speed. As you know, board members, we take into consideration many variables in terms of closing school. And first and foremost of our decision making uh, is the safety of our young people. Uh, when we have close to 18,000 young people, the majority of which are uh, transported by bus, mm -hmm. we have a number of them, high, the high schoolers who are transport themselves by cars as young drivers. <coughs> uh, we have several thousand employees uh, who are then transporting individuals who come in from out of county and then as well as the number of parents uh, that are moving. So when we uh, figuratively uh, start the school system engine up every morning, it's quite a lot of movement in the county, and we always err on the side of safety. The storm that came in last week, I don't need to recapitulate that with, with everybody, but it was quite uh, an incredible storm for all of us, but the fact that combined with the cold uh, air caused us to, to close for the total of the whole week last week, uh, those uh, total of four days. So those of you who are following along uh, understand that we have built in five official days to the calendar. We have allow a sixth day in the calendar because we have a professional development day on May 2nd in our calendar, which is, if you look in the fine print of your calendar, a makeup day if needed. So my plan this evening, and it is the plan this evening, is that so far we've used six days, we built five in, we have six built in, we've used six, excuse me, um, we're even right now. If we use the, make the adjustment to the calendar for March or May 2nd being a day we would be in school. So if we follow that logic, that's all fine and good with the exception of any further inclement weather days. So as it stands now, the five we built in, we've used. I'm now going to use the one in May so there will be school on May 2nd, that's six. Day seven, eight, or any others from there will be either tacked on at the end or the possibility exists that I could apply for a waiver from the State Board of Education justifying our great concerns. And I think we have a case for that based upon the fact of uh, the um, concerns we have with plowing the back roads, the incredible cold temperatures that hit the, the state. Um, the issues of concern with that presents us. So I'm going to allow that to continue to roll out. Uh, there's nothing for us to do immediately uh, in terms of other days on the calendar. We just have to wait and see. But there are things that we can do to adjust that calendar. 
do recognize that uh, people always question the fact of the number of days. State law requires that young people are in school 180 days. We have contractual agreements that we have to follow with our teachers and staff. And as it stands now, um, we hope that we have no more further inclement weather. But as I stated to one of our reporters, if a op uh, another uh, event presents itself, we will make the best decision in terms of safety, not the number of days that we've used thus far. And so I, as I look to the community right now, I continue to appreciate your patience and your trust in our decision making. I encourage you to continue uh, to make people be very clear when they say, you know, why are they closing school? Or, you know, when I was a child, you know, we went up to, we went to school and we walked up hill both ways with no shoes. You know, there's all kinds of different stories. When you have a county as large as ours and there's back roads and several of you in here have driven buses and know about all of that, our back roads are very treacherous. Uh, I rode the roads personally on Friday, on Thursday. Uh, we rode on Wednesday, Mr. Clements and myself and the roads were very treacherous on those days, uh, quite frankly, and we were very concerned about the back roads. And so I would rather lose a day of school as opposed to jeopardize and put a life in jeopardy in that sense. So safety is always our main issue. We're gonna to continue to monitor that because we can always make up a school day, but we cannot uh, make up any kind of loss of life or injury of an individual. So we take these very serious. And I and continue to encourage and indulge the, ask for the patience of our community as we're all working and navigating our way through these inclement weather days. And it's not even the end of January yet. Sometimes our worst events can occur in February, as they say. So let's hope for no snow tonight. I did hear it's snowing in Ridge. Is that true, Mr. Clements? And in Hollywood. Well, it can stay there. <laughs> <laughs> Until I hear snow in Hollywood, California, maybe or, uh, we'll react, then there will be an event. So I wanted to give you that piece of information. Um, we have weathered these storms very well as far as the building, et cetera. Uh, we did have a water main break on January 7th uh, during the inclement weather and the cold weather during that time. We were able to mitigate that and um, open the school then shortly thereafter the next day. Soup cook-off has been canceled. Everything has been rescheduled. We had a wonderful day today with our board hearing. If I haven't told you lately, if I haven't told any of you, uh, did you hear about the graduation rate in St. Mary's County? It's 91.5%, the highest ever. I say that sort of joking this evening because I spent a whole hour and a half on this this afternoon announcing how exciting that is to our community. Uh, the overall graduation rate is 91.5%, and that is the highest ever. And to frame that, um, you know, the state of Maryland is 86 uh, percent. Uh, in the United States, it's 78 percent. So we're in very high air. Our school system is high performing, and we're very pleased about that. But we had that presentation today. Um, there are a number of other items uh, th that I have as well, but I think I can suspend those until the next time. I want to continue to encourage people to donate to the shoe fund. And thank those who have. I will be reading those, that comprehensive list at the next board meeting because there's an additional list, I understand, coming down from uh, finance as well on that. So we'll do that as one big issue. And, and I was talking to several people today, including my wife, about the fact of individuals who do donate to the shoe fund. Uh, this is money that is donated um, specifically to provide shoes for the children in St. Mary's County. So no matter how much that is, if somebody were to write a check for $20, uh, for the shoe fund. That's $20 that's going to go to the school system fund, that's going to go directly to buy a pair of shoes that will go on the feet of young people in St. Mary's County. There's no overhead, no administrative costs. That money, 100% of it, goes directly to buy those shoes. And Dr. Ridgell oversees that with uh, the PPWs, and we are just pleased with how many pairs of shoes we're able to put on our young people. And this is a personal uh, quest of all of us is to make certain we're doing everything we can uh, to close that poverty gap, uh, to provide shoes and clothing for our young people as well as for food, uh, as far as free and reduced meals and breakfast in our schools. And it's interesting, over these snow days, I had several emails from our principals who said, uh, we appreciate the fact of taking safety into consideration. They were very concerned about the safety of their students and several of them said they were concerned about their students being fed during the times that we were off. So we take that into consideration as well. And I just want to thank the community. I'm absolutely blessed to live and work in St. Mary's County. 
and absolutely pleased with the outpouring of support that we have for our school system, uh, for our children, and the work that we do. And it makes the work so rewarding when you see students today, as we were talking about the achievement and the graduation rates at all three of our high schools at the highest level. And it's just very satisfying work uh, is to give uh, on behalf of the benefit of young people and the less fortunate in our community. So on that note, Dr. Raspa, uh, with great uh, humbleness and sincerity, I'm very proud um, to report this information today as well as pass it back to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is a public hearing. The public hearing this evening is to hear testimony on the high school program of studies and policies ECG, EF, and EFA. Uh, Madam Secretary, has anybody signed up to give testimony in the public hearing? Uh, yes, for the high school program of studies. For the high school program of studies, okay. <clears throat> Just bear with me while I read the public comment statement. The board welcomes input, public input on policies and issues affecting our schools. The board takes this time to listen and consider, but not to comment. This is not, however, the appropriate forum for negative comments or criticisms of individual staff or students. Concerns about individual staff members that cannot be resolved at the level closest to the situation should be directed to the superintendent. This board will not permit comments criticizing individual staff or students since this is outside the scope of public comment. Additionally, the board sits as an appellate body in both student and employee appeals. The board cannot comment on or have prior knowledge of a case that would influence their ability to deliberate. To maintain the ability of the board to render a fair and unbiased decision, comments regarding individual student or personnel issues cannot be presented at public comment. Speakers <clears throat> must sign in at the beginning of the meeting. Public comment is, list, is limited to three minutes per speaker and speakers may not yield their time to someone else. The board encourages speakers to to present written statements to the board secretary who will distribute copies to all board members. Madam Secretary, first speaker. Nathan Gamberlin. No, go to the podium, please. Thank you. And that light should be on to make sure that is. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, first, I'd like to start off with thanking everyone for their time this evening, um, the board and other members of the, uh, not the board, the public. <laughs> um, I'd like to start with my introduction. Um, my name's Nathan Gemberling. I graduated high school at Leonardtown in 2012. Um, <clears throat> first started FFA in 2010. It didn't technically exist. Um, I was given the task to make it exist. So, um, we worked and finally got it chartered, I believe in the fall of 2011, is what's on our certificate. So we chartered the uh, FFA out of, um, out, of, out of need from, you know, students who have wanted to be in it and from uh, the Farm Bureau. So it was kind of a double header of uh, people who wanted this to happen. So we made it happen. We got the uh, charter going. Now we're just trying to gain momentum. Um, I'm no longer an active member, I'm too old, but I'm a uh, senior advisor for the chapter, so I still um, <clears throat> am involved with what they do. And I know that they're doing pretty well. Um, they're gaining momentum, but um, they're limited by the classes that they have right now. They only have two um, that you can attend that are agricultural certified that allow you to attend the program. So if this case program is adopted, it will add a third. Um, or possibly replace one. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but um, I know both classes, natural resources management and horticulture, are trying to um, implement parts of the curriculum into the their current classes to fill a need for that agricultural education that's not there currently. So I know that both classes utilize this information for students who are interested and for their own interests so that they can teach it, but it's kind of 
starting to stray a little bit, I guess, from um, what they're actually supposed to teach. So this would free up a lot of room in their curriculum to continue with their individual programs and allow for a third, more comprehensive curriculum for um, this individual agriculture education program. And uh, I know there's a lot of students in the school system, 4-H um, uh, members and uh, people who want to farm, people who are currently, you know, farming and stuff who want to, you know, gain more education, maybe someone who just likes animals. Um, so I think there'd be a lot of interest in this program. And uh, I think it's, um, funding-wise, I think the, the initial fund would probably um, be the most. I think that it would probably sustain itself through um, different business opportunities and fundraisers. I know with the FFA we uh, we did a lot of fun, we did as many fundraisers as we could given the time that we had and the restrictions on a fledgling club or organization. So um, I would like to, um, I'd like to thank you for your time and please consider this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Charlie Sasser the third, and I'm a junior at Great Mills High School. I'm in the STEM program, and I'm really interested in this uh, program because I am one of those kids that grows up on a farm. But knowing all I've learned from the farm, I see kids at my school who haven't grown up on a farm, and they could really use the program. I see some of my peers, you know, they kind of show an interest for this kind of stuff, but really the far most exposure they get is biology, and we have a little bit of environmental stuff, and the teacher will hit on some agriculture. But I think a, a program like this would really be helpful uh, in people who have that interest or who want to further their knowledge, such as me, or who just want to learn more and uh, gain some knowledge about just how their food is grown and things like that. Uh, as far as FFA, I think when I think of uh, when I thought of high school when I was younger, probably my biggest thing I've always wanted to dream, I've always wanted to accomplish in high school is I've always wanted to be an FFA. And so this program would, uh, in addition to teaching about agriculture, would uh, reinvigorate the FFA chapter and I would like to be a participant in that I don't know if I'm too old but I'd like to help w in whatever way I could and you know I really want to get to national convention because you know I have through 4-H I've met a lot of people from across the state who they have FFA chapters at their schools and they always tell me about it and uh, about the national convention and all the contests they do and I mean, it really sounds like fun, and there's a lot of opportunities that students can benefit from. And I think since we are in such a r rural county, but then we have uh, a lot of urban opportunities and influences in the county, uh, just an agriculture program would be a good way to kind of bring some of that rural knowledge back into the school system. So, you know, if you can make this happen, I'd really appreciate it as a student. I know there's a lot of people who would appreciate it. So thank you. And Let's see what we can do. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gabrielle Corey, and I'm representing St. Mary's County Farm Bureau and Maryland Farm Bureau as Miss Maryland Agriculture. I'm 16 years old and currently in 11th grade at Leonardtown High School. I've lived in St. Mary's County my whole life, and growing up around agriculture has had an important effect on me. My experiences with 4-H and Farm Bureau have opened my eyes and allowed me to realize what a diverse industry agriculture is. As a nine-year 4-H member carrying the projects of market <coughs> lands, public speaking, and leadership, I have been able to travel across the state and participate in various agricultural activities that have helped me grow into the person I am today. I'm here to express my support for putting agricultural education back into schools. The number one industry in Maryland is agriculture. St. Mary's County has strong roots reaching back to farming. With such a legacy, with 68,000 acres still in use, why not educate our future generation about opportunities that are available in the number one industry in Maryland? 
In schools, there used to be home economics classes that then were replaced by technology classes as this became more prominent. Along with these technology classes, science, technology, engineering, and math, often referred to as STEM, has really taken off because of our close proximity to Patuxent River Naval Air Station. It is grooming our future generation of local engineering workforce. While science, technology, engineering, and math have a promising future, so should agriculture. Agriculture that once started as labor in the fields has now grown into a greatly diverse and scientific industry. Students should be well informed of their career opportunities to allow agriculture to also have a promising future and provide St. Mary's County with a future legacy for future farming generations. There are currently FFA affiliated programs available for students in the Horticulture and Natural Resources programs at the Dr. James A. Forrest Career and Technology Center. As a first year student at the Forest Center, in the dental assisting program, but still with the interest in agriculture, I was looking forward to joining FFA. I'm, the case curriculum that will be implemented at the Forest Center will lay the foundation for careers in agriculture as well as provide college preparation. Agriculture is just as important as technology because it is the first step in producing the food that we eat. We need to protect our number one industry and allow our generations to become more involved and engaged in agriculture and its many aspects. We ask that you please support the funding for the addition of an agricultural education in school. Agriculture has had a positive impact on my life, and I support providing these opportunities for future generations in St. Mary's County Public Schools. It will be money well spent on our future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And give her a round of applause. Yeah. I wanted to recognize her publicly for as well as the other two so far. Miss Agriculture Maryland here. Yep. Right. You know, Maryland. one of our yeah. students from St. Mary's County. You know how proud I am of all of you, but I just want to acknowledge you personally for that major accomplishment as well. I want to say that publicly. We're so proud of you, and uh, it's just great to have you here tonight. Uh, and I might say that to the other speakers thus far as well, but I've been looking for that public opportunity to acknowledge you. You're just wonderful. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jamie Raley. I'm here tonight as president of St. Mary's County Farm Bureau. And I'd like to thank the school board and school staff for your efforts in getting the ag education program uh, in your tentative budget to be uh, submitted to the Board of County Commissioners. I think uh, it speaks, speaks highly of the opportunities, and I've been hearing that word from our young people tonight, opportunities for young people, because while we look forward to having more people engaged in agriculture, production agriculture, the curriculum for ag education and technology also wants to look for the next generation of, and future generations of veterinarians, ag economists, extension agents, people who are going to be, go out and teach other folks how to do what we do here in St. Mary's and around the world. Uh, thank you very much to the young people who came here tonight to speak on behalf of us, uh, of agriculture in the county, because those are the ones that are most important. Again, I appreciate it. I appreciate all the help of Mr. Uh, uh, Michael Egan. Uh, we, we, he's been very, very helpful with uh, keeping us in, informed about the progress of the uh, program through, through the system. Again, thank you very much for your efforts, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Joseph Wood. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph Wood, and I have a small farm in Mechanicsville. Uh, I embrace this science and technology term that we're using for this curriculum and uh, and I kind of related back to a uh, incident in my teenage years very very early teenage years I had with my grandfather I was telling him that we should do this and we should do that and we should stop doing this and all this stuff and he just kind of uh, listened and turned to me and says you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So that's what I'm trying to say here, that we've got to start in the high schools and we've got to teach kids 
about the environment, the impact farming on uh, the way we work, work the land, that, that it has the impact on the bay and everybody else around us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Has uh, anyone signed up for <clears throat> testimony on policies? No. Okay. The public hearing is closed at this time. Anybody for public comment? No public comment. All right. There'll be no yeah. public. I think the superintendent would like to make some remarks. Okay. All right. Dr. Monterano, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, if you're here tonight uh, to support the case curriculum, could you please stand up, if you would, if you're here representing the Farm Bureau, the case curriculum. Uh, I would let you stay standing, if you would. Thank you to all the speakers who are here this evening. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Education, we want to thank you. Uh, we do want to let you know where the, uh, the status of this program is uh, right now. Today, we had our budget work session. Uh, the board has uh, encouraged me to continue to add that to the budget. There's a whole process we were going through with it. I encourage all of you, uh, with your level of commitment that you've shown tonight in front of our board, to also be a part of the budget process with the Board of County Commissioners as the ultimate funding source for us. Uh, right now, we have added it in as a uh, part of our budget uh, that I'm presenting to the school board, and I really appreciate your advocacy this evening. Uh, to everybody who spoke tonight, thank you for doing that. And again, to our young people uh, who are still in school, go home and get a good night's rest because you have school tomorrow. Uh, and we'll proceed accordingly in that sense. That's wishful thinking. And we move forward. But uh, board, board members, I wanted you to see the number of people who have come out tonight. And there's also been the acknowledgement of Michael Egan, who's back in the corner there somewhere. Uh, he is responsible for the implementation right now. And we'll have further information from him. So thank you very much for coming out. Thank you for attending this evening. <clears throat> It'd be nice to have ag agriculture back at the uh, Forest Center, part of the curriculum. There's no question about it. Is there a motion to uh, to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second it. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. There were no action items tonight. Moving along into information items. The first information item we have is the St. Mary's County Public Schools Kindergarten Update Maryland <coughs> Model of uh, School Readiness. Mrs. Hall and uh, Miss Cindy Kilcoyne. Begin whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. We're happy evening. to be here. Um, Mrs. Kilcoin and I are going to speak to the status of kindergarten and give you an update on our Maryland model for school readiness assessment and our results. Thank you. And right now, just kind of the lay of the land, uh, our kindergarten students participate in a full day of developmentally appropriate um, activities and practices. Enrollment as of December was 1,349 students, and each classroom is taught by a highly qualified early childhood educator as well as a paraeducator. So we're very fortunate to have that staffing. Okay, Mrs. Kilcoin will walk through what a typical day looks like and the kinds of things that students are learning to do. Uh, 
Um, our activities include whole group instruction, and then in the smaller group instruction, we do guided reading, math instruction, social studies and science, and then our developmentally appropriate choice centers, which is, of course, the children's favorite time of the day. They get to choose what they would like to learn about for that day. Uh, just a couple of pictures to share with you of the typical daily schedule. Our teachers present it to children in, a, in many different ways. This is just two uh, ways that we've seen it presented. One is a pocket chart where they're removing each activity as it happens, and the other is presented on an Elmo. Um, we have age centers are at age appropriate choices and this is a, a picture of the free choice chart in one of our classrooms where the children choose where they want to go and then the second picture is a picture of one of the centers which is a really rich reading experience for the children in the classroom. Okay. Here are some pictures of the um, kinds of joyful learning that's happening in our kindergarten. You can see all kinds of math and reading activities. Um, our goal in kindergarten is we are learning to read and then reading to learn and very important to us as early childhood educators loving to read. Foundational math patterns and this is a, one of the uh, things that our children do is learn a lot about patterning and this uh, the second picture is a picture from one of our elementary schools where the children did an activity with red, ye uh, yellow and green apples and then they each placed one in the hallway. It took the entire hallway of the school to illustrate that cool graph of what they all like to do. And then assessing the learning our teachers, it's very important that our teachers are constantly looking and, at what the children are learning and assessing how they're learning. And so in that portfolio assessment that we'll talk about in a minute, MMSR, there are opportunities for the teacher to collect actual samples of the children's work. And here are just two times that we saw that happen. And the Maryland Model for School Readiness is a portfolio assessment, and it's assessed using ratings in the eight domains of learning, which you see listed there. Um, and it, it is collected, the next slide. It is um, a work sampling system, so data is collected through daily work with the children. And in the fall, a portfolio is begun for each child as they enter. For the first six to eight weeks of school, teachers are collecting all that data. And then observational reporting to the state happens in November, and then they continue to collect through the rest of the year, and it's reported again in the spring. How we are doing. Okay, we're very proud of this. This is our own personal grad rate. <laughs> you can see. It's a day of success. <laughs> Here we go. Um, you can take a look at, as Dr. Martirano says, let me quote him. I've been retweeting him all day. <laughs> let, let um, data is all a relative thing, and how do we compare? So what you see is the Maryland model of school readiness. Maryland's um, rate is 82%, and then you can see our rate of 88 percent and then our neighboring counties of Charles and Calvert and I'm proud to say on this assessment we are doing very well we're outperforming our neighboring counties and we're also outperforming the state we're very proud of that and that's where it starts that leads to graduation mm -hmm. But as always, we have a new assessment system coming. The Early Childhood Comprehensive Assessment System is the first project in the Early Learning Challenge Grant, which is a partnership between Maryland and Ohio. And one, it's just one part of that, that Early Learning Challenge Grant. And the hallmark of that whole thing is the kindergarten entrance assessment. And we're learning about that as we go. They did a blind field test of that assessment in um, December. and. Two of our schools were part of that blind field test. They're now collecting all that data, looking at it, and deciding how we're going to roll that out. And then the kindergarten assessment is an assessment of seven domains of learning, which are listed for you there. Social, emotional, physical, motor, language and literacy, math, scientific thinking, social studies, and the arts. Kindergarten is a wonderful learning experience. And we want everybody to know learning is fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And now we have just a short video to share with all of you, just a video of one of our teachers of whom we're quite proud. Miss Courtney Tyra is a kindergarten teacher at George Washington Carver, and we have a video of one of her lessons. Okay. So let's come. Oh, where's Maddie now? Is she in first grade? It's very green. Did she use a little arrow?
that is the status of our kindergarten at this time. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Board members, comments, questions? Uh, Mrs. Allen? It's always nice to see what our students are doing. We all are in and out of schools often, um, but uh, I think we all think back to the days of our early education, whether it was kindergarten or, or first grade, um, and uh, you have this vision of what it was. Uh, I don't ever remember sitting in, in a classroom at any level and having a teacher say, this is the problem, what are our solutions? And the fact that we're doing it in kindergarten, giving students those tools to solve problems, how powerful that is. Solving problems when they're little problems and teaching them the steps they need to go through um, gives them great conflict management skills, it gives them great thinking skills, and um, it allows them to be creative. And I, I just think that's wonderful. So thank you for taking the time to share this with us this evening. I really appreciate it. Mrs. Washington. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, what I appreciate mostly is that you're teaching children how to problem solve, how to be problem solvers. Really, the first steps to being critical thinkers you know, that this is the problem, what are, and that I do have choices. I do have choices. And I think it's great um, that you're teaching such skills in kindergarten. And one other thing I love, many things, but I'll just say one more, is for children to develop a love for reading. That is key, developing a, a love for reading. Now, how do you deal with students who are already reading when they enter kindergarten? because uh, many of them are already reading. What you would have seen in this lesson is that the lesson is very, very differentiated. When she did the, the, read it, the writing at the beginning, each of those children then receives a paper where they are re writing at their own level a problem and a solution. So that's, and that was part of the lesson, but it didn't make it into that tape. But so it's, the lessons are all very, very differentiated depending on what you are able to do. That's what you're taught, and you're taught at that level, and you keep moving forward. That's, that's why we're looking at a lot of small group instruction, so we can instruct everybody kind of where they are. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Matthews. I think you all are doing fantastic. Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, the MSSR data is <laughs> top notch. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Crosby. Yeah, I think you are too. Uh, it seems to me that mandatory kindergarten for all kids is it 07 or 08? One or the other. Yeah, seven, I think. So it was required yeah. by then. We actually implemented it a bit earlier than that. And we're in 13 that. now, five years later. That th all this really helps, and it also helps the grandparents don't like, spend all the money on the kindergarten. <laughs> Tell me, I know about that. Uh, well, I had a question here. On, uh, and the solution and the problem solving that is very important all the way through for all of us in life. I thought that was good. How many kids, there you go, how many kids are in the class? 20? I think there are like 23 in that class. With uh, an assistant, correct? With an assistant, yes. Very good, very good. Thank you very much for Thank all you, Mrs. Crosby. Great job. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. And please relay to the teacher that's doing a great job. Please. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Moderano, you have no, I'm just comments? Well, I mean, uh, I've said so much today about the data. And that's just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for oh, me to say geez. that I'm speechless is, is, is not true. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of the meeting time, I will. They know how I feel. They know the words. The, the inter early interventions. It just adds another problem. We gave them a huge shout out today during our presentation, Thanks. and it starts with the literacy piece and the numeracy. So, echo that. What the goal is in terms of our entire school system that everybody in the school district needs to feel responsible for the data and take great pride in the work. So when we talk about that singular number of a graduation rate and what it means to our community, everybody takes responsibility for that. And share that with your early intervention teachers, our pre-K, Head Start, the whole piece in terms of the kindergarten, all of it. Okay. It's just important. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Can I say Thank something? You. And they're yeah. building yeah. a firm foundation yes. for these students so they can go on to be graduates and then become productive contributing members of society so we don't have to deal with that 
dropout rate. If we get them a good solid foundation and um, head start, pre-K, kindergarten, our students are well on their way. So you are part of that important piece to get our students to graduate and to graduate on time. Absolutely, it starts there. Yep, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, moving along. Dr. Rigel, 2014-2015 school operating calendars. Okay, good evening, board. Good evening. Tonight is the first reading for the 2014-2015 school system calendars. Both the school system operational calendar and the Chesapeake Public Charter School calendar. The public hearing will be held at the February 12th meeting and the second reading for your approval will be at the February 26th meeting. I remind everyone this is only a proposed calendar and it is not official until your approval on February 26. The school system operational calendar was developed by a committee of teachers, principals, assistant principals, central office representatives, as well as representatives from the Education Association of St. Mary's County, the Collective Education Association of St. Mary's County, and the County Council of PTAs. The charter school calendar was developed by the governing board. Ms. Fania is here to answer any questions this evening as well. The proposed operational calendar before you has several changes from past years. Uh, one is to shift the August professional day ar days around to be more effectively to meet teachers' needs. Shift the early dismissals to a consistent day of the week to the extent possible, and Tuesday will be that day. Switch the purposes of the September and January professional days to align the professional development with each semester, and provide Head Start and pre-kindergarten parent involvement activities on early dismissal days to provide structured parent engagement activities. I'll talk about each of these as we come to them in the calendar. First one then is those back to school professional days for staff. This would be the proposed calendar for the four professional days before school opens. Note that the school system and the charter school are proposing rearranging the days to facilitate classroom preparation time. So the classroom preparation day would be on the Friday for the school system August the 15th. Normally it's Monday with the professional day on Friday. So this would reverse them. Teachers would then have Friday the 15th to prepare their classrooms. The professional day would then be held on Monday. The charter school is proposing rearranging their days as well to facilitate that classroom preparation time. The first day of schools for students will be on a Wednesday to facilitate any opening adjustments versus going five straight days for the first week. For the school system, that would be Wednesday, August the 20th. For the charter school, that is Wednesday, August the 6th. Labor Day is a holiday for students and staff, so all schools and offices are closed. There is no school for students with a school-based professional day for staff. Note that this is one, another one of the changes in the professional days. Normally, this would be a county-wide professional day. That will shift then to January the 16th. So there would be a professional day countywide in August, when in January at the beginning of each of the semesters. Instead, September the 19th would then become a school-based professional day. 
The proposal is to maintain the Parent and Guardian Conference Day on Columbus Day, would be October the 13th. Historically, we have found this day to be family friendly, given many parents have the day off from work. The Maryland State Education Association's convention includes Friday, October the 17th. There is no school for students with a school-based professional day for staff. The general election is on Tuesday, November the 4th. Since many schools are used as polling places, all schools and offices would be closed. All schools and offices are closed for Veterans Day on November the 11th. The Thanksgiving holiday includes Wednesday to provide time for families to travel. So then it would be Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The schools would be closed and then reopen the following Monday, December the 1st. Winter break. Schools would close on Friday, December the 19th, and reopen on January the 5th. Including weekends, this would be 16 consecutive days. January 16th then would be that other system-wide professional day for staff, no school for students. This is one of those changes. This would permit a system-wide, again, professional day at the beginning of each of the semesters, critical as we talk about the implementation of the college and career ready standards and the park assessments. All schools and offices are closed on Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, January the 19th. Aligned with the January 16th professional day, this creates a four-day weekend for students. President's Day is a holiday, so all schools and offices are closed on February the 16th. Spring break will be 10 days, an ideal opportunity for family trips instead of missing school days. So schools would close on Friday, March the 27th and reopen on Tuesday, April 7th. No school for students on Friday, May 1st, Articulation Day. Articulation Day is used to facilitate the transition of students between grades and among the schools for the next school year. It is also designated as a professional inclement weather makeup day if needed. Every turn of the day brings that up, doesn't it? <laughs> Memorial Day, May 25th, no school for students and staff. The proposed calendar also includes time for staff collaborative planning, critical for lesson planning and the monitoring of student learning as we implement the college and career ready standards and park assessments. And the days for collaborative planning varies between the school system and the charter school. The calendar also includes early dismissals for professional responsibilities, as well as the Head Start and pre-K parent involvement activities. Professional responsibilities, of course, include grading and report cards at the uh, time for the end of the interim and marking periods. The Charter School also provides early dismissals for staff to complete the narrative report cards. Since the charter school opens 10 days before the other schools, their calendar provides for three recesses during the year, October 6th to the 10th, February 12th and 13th, and May 20th and 22nd. The last day for students will be June 16th. This includes five built-in days for inclement weather that will be backed off if not needed. Uh, that would make the earliest June 9th if the inclement weather days are not needed. Keep in mind this is the 14-15 school year calendar, <laughs> not the current one. <laughs> and the last day for teachers would be June 17th if the five days of inclement weather is used. Any questions? Maybe there'll be a resurgence of global warming. There's, no, there's not been much talk about that recently. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dr. Ridgell, thank you very much. Uh, board members, questions, comments? 
Uh, Mrs. Crosby. Yes. Yeah. Maybe I'll have to have my daughter call you, but she claims there's a big rebellion in Wildwood about having to get up too early. <laughs> Take all the elementary, I mean, they're all going to be going, going to middle school and they want to sleep longer. So should it be, can you give me a, a simple answer to give her? <sighs> I was going to throw it off on you, but you might as well let me have it. I have not, I do not know of any changes in school starting times. It's pretty early, though, for middle school, isn't it? For the first day of school? For throughout the year, isn't it? She's, you're, are you talking about the start of the start. time of the day? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's different, different than, that's a, different yeah, than yeah, the Yeah, that's calendar. not the calendar committee. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's based on many other factors besides the calendar. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, I, I know. We'd have to probably buy a whole uh, raft of new buses to accommodate every little whim. It's uh, it, starting times are complicated. It, yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Has you. it ever come up before? <laughs> well, not to the calendar committee because we don't <laughs> do start <laughs> times. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. But, but thank you, Mr. Go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, Dr. Monroe, you look. I would just provide some clarity there. I mean, yes. the, we're, when we're talking about the calendar, it's interesting because the fact there's a as we've talked about this in the past, once you put in all the must-haves, there's not a lot of flexibility. Correct. So I appreciate the work that, uh, that you do in, in regards to this, and then the compatibility with uh, the compare and contrast of the charter school. We have the principal here tonight as well, uh, and you, you do a great job. There's certain inherent values that dictate that. Uh, great conversation across the state right now regarding starting school after Labor Day. Uh, the superintendents have come out and have opposed that. I presented testimony to the task force on that recently. But that's in motion and you need to be aware of that as it plays implications because that could be accelerated in the process. So we'll keep an eye on that. As far as Mrs. Crosby's uh, concerns regarding uh, the, the school start times for the day, uh, this county has actually uh, made some moves prior to my arrival to make that adjustment uh, because it's a large county. Uh, we have a tiered system as far as our buses and we've made the decision to put the high schoolers in the, in the middle tier uh, of that run, the, uh, excuse me, the high schoolers in the middle tier, uh, middle schools at first, and... They're in the earliest, Yeah, right? so middle school, high school, elementary, in terms of that tier, and when you have the system of which we have, you have to do that, uh, you know, in that sense because we don't have enough buses just That's for high school and then That's elementary exactly and then high school. Told. I told her that too. So we adjusted for the developmental issues, the adolescent pieces, of high schoolers needing more sleep. We also have a longer day than some of the other school districts where we're oh, six hours. Oh good, I'm glad you told me that yeah, one. We're six hours and 45 minutes. Hold on, I got But this is getting great attention because I was surprised that we were, we've been rather progressive because we dealt with this issue a while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Montgomery County is now dealing with that issue uh, and everything that we have in place, Montgomery County is moving to, uh, to tier their systems the way that we have it. Uh, they have it right now where it's high school, middle, elementary. They're flip-flopping the high school and middle. And then uh, they have a, they're adjusting the time of their day too because they have a shorter elementary day. So they're making it more compatible with what we have. Uh, so th that's, that's a challenge. We continue to work with parents. Uh, and the, the middle schoolers, you know, have to make certain that we get them prepared by starting going to bed earlier, getting up earlier, and it's a process for them. We receive uh, very few concerns about that throughout the year. In fact, uh, non-existent, quite frankly. She's going to have to get on to the county council. Yeah, and, and express that. But then the other piece is, um, again, I always use the uh, statement for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah, what are the alternatives yeah. and how do we do that? We've gone through the internal, how could we just shave off 10 minutes? That within itself, I have never seen such a challenge mm -hmm. just to shave off 10 minutes, to move the starting time back 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Because then, again, sort of like, uh, you know, whack-a-mole. You put one head down, the next one pops up. Okay, we take care of that front load, but then we push everything back 10 minutes further. It starts impacting the athletic schedules. Then you get into daylight savings, a later uh, pickup time for the elementary kids. So what we've tried to do is strike the right balance between the developmental issues, uh, and I'm talking about this calendar-wise too, strike the right balance between family time, longer summers, the instructional day hours, 180 days, the teacher's contract, all the must-haves, and then balance that with the length of the, the student day and manage that with the teacher work day as well. 
I think we probably have hit the right balance with it, but there's always going to be a consideration because somebody's going to feel like in elementary we like sleeping later. There's always going to be somebody who wants to start earlier in that sense. The piece of it is, Mrs. Crosby, and I appreciate if uh, the community of Wildwood is they're advancing to the uh, middle school level, I encourage them to either ask us to come speak to them, which we're always available to do, mm -hmm. to explain them in terms Let of me the write information. That down too. Write that down. We're always available <laughs> to speak to community. And then to talk to the principals. You know, they, they oh, spend time. Uh, I can tell you, Miss Mills uh, does a fabulous like job of, of, of advancing to the, the, the middle school level. Uh, of those and what that is. And then you also know my final piece, Dr. Raspa, thank you for allowing me the, the opportunity to, to talk. Um, the, also the other issue is all of our academies and our STEM programs and different things have the hub bus systems and they run a little earlier as well, you know, in terms of getting there and what needs to be done. In the scheme of it, if we were a smaller county and an urban county uh, where, you know, you have tightly compacted neighborhoods, uh, we don't. So therefore, we have long routes. It takes longer to get to places than other places. But when I worked in Montgomery and Howard and Prince George's tightly compact neighborhoods, a run from the elementary to move to the middle to the high was a lot less time in terms of travel from one school to the next. So you could have a little bit more level of compression. So I just brought that whole picture up mm -hmm. as it ties into the calendar, not to get it mixed up. One is calendar and one is start time. And again, both of these topics are getting, uh, getting some attention in the legislative session. There's a bill out there regarding start times generated as a result of the conversation uh, around Montgomery County. So thank oh, you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Monterano. Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Ridgel. No questions. Mrs. Washington. I see something very interesting. Uh, it says early dismissals for professional responsibilities and head start and pre-kindergarten parent involvement activities. Could you share? One of the, the great things about having Head Start this year is being able to increase the amount of work with the families in addition to having the students in school. So we'd like to expand that to the pre-kindergarten families as well next year so that in being able to use those designated days, it could be for the teachers to go out on home visits, it could be for the families to come to school for parent conferences. It could be for other school related kinds of activities to be able to work more closely the school and the families. That's interesting. Um, could you tell more what those activities would be? I mean, you give a general. Yeah, and I want to know a little bit more. Did you really you emphasize the fact that currently when there's uh, those early dismissal days, we had an inequity in terms of AM and PM. We did that also. So let's make sure we're framing this at the higher level. Exactly. The recommendation this year, uh, and I appreciate you bringing the question up, Mrs. Washington, I will get to that, but I want to make certain we understand before we would have AM, PM, and we would have maybe five, ten more days, right, of mm -hmm. construction for one exactly. versus the other. What we've gone back to do is to provide, the only way to provide equity, because the every canceling AM, PM one day and PM in the, in the morning, the next, it just doesn't work. Right. We had so much confusion regarding buses. We've now said on those days, there will be no AM or PM, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. On those days, because they're, the developmental needs that need to occur for the young people, they're going, going to be going into the homes, working with the families, bringing them in for training, how to be parenting skills, a whole series of things uh, that we feel are necessary uh, in terms of the Head Start curriculum. Uh, there's a whole different level of curriculum, even when we think of uh, how the young people are eating in terms of family style. But working with the parents is critical in terms of skills needed for parenting, reading, developmental issues, maturation, any ways that we can assist. So the teachers are not going to have a day of kicking back, but their day is going to be devoted to servicing the young people at a different level. And we can generate a whole series of lists of things occurring. Yeah. And this has been That's very, very, very strong. <coughs> because we, we view it as, um, I'm trying to think of the proverb about teaching someone to fish. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, mm -hmm. can't mm -hmm. quite think of it exactly, but that's the philosophy. We mm -hmm. want to teach the parents how to be better parents, working with the family so that, that can carry on for generations. It's that parent liaison, the parent support, because if you remember the parents who qualify for this program, it's, it's a certain level of economic issues and a level of disadvantage in terms of that. So we want to provide that gap. 
we were also very uh, concerned uh, about the poverty gap, the, the, the needs that the young people had as far as shoes, clothing, uh, immunizations. Uh, we can talk firsthand uh, with the, uh, the, the nurse who was, in play, who was in place at that program and the needs for the young people, but the great need is that we can work with the young people, but if we're not assisting the parents as well, the work that we're doing in school, then there's that level of regression. So I'm very pleased of this, but I, I, I'm sorry we didn't illuminate that at a higher level because this has mm -hmm. been a conversation at this dais yes. for years oh, yes. about the inequity of AMPM. And I think this is a really good recommendation because there's no, at the same time, meeting the, 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 the requirements. Anything you want to say on that? I mean, I don't yeah, know if I'm I doing would. it justice. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, but thank you. <laughs> Very good. Come on up to the podium. I'm sorry. Yeah. Come on up here. Sounds really good. Yeah, it's a great idea. It's about family engagement, and, it, and it's about bringing families together and helping parents learn the parenting skills as well as how to prepare their children so that our readiness for kindergarten continues to be what it is right now. And what we see is that in providing the, the kinds of learning that we'll be providing by bringing parents into school or going into their homes will allow us to teach them what they need to know in order to get their children ready to be here when they come to kindergarten. You know, for our pre-K program, you know, we're trying to align it, uh, you know, a four-year-old program, whether it's Head Start or pre-kindergarten, those teachers have 40 students, and that's been difficult to get all of those families right. into conference. This will be um, will help us ensure that we can, we can do that, that every family will have the opportunity for a conference. Certainly some will have home visits. There may be some parent training workshops specifically for early childhood um, as we work through it. But, but really, at the calendar committee, the, the idea of conferencing and making that doable was, was well received by the teachers that were present and also the parents and the PTA members well, that were well, present. Well, Kelly, also illuminate the data, and this is data that we can share because it's a general piece of data. We had a, a number of, how many students were enrolled the first day for Head Start? Oh, um, 161. Yeah, so to give you an example of a, a need for intervention, of those 161, only a few had their immunization records right. up to where it needed to be. Right. And when I say a few, I'm using a hand, and it's less than what's on my hand out of 161. We uh, had to. So you see um, what I'm talking yes, about yes. here? Oh, yeah, it's that's, a different that's level. what I wanted specificity yeah. as to level. what involvement activities yeah. were, would be going yeah. on because it's, I applaud this. I think it's wonderful, but I want you to know what exactly are you right. doing? Right. You so know, not general, but. We had to follow up with each one of those families Correct. at that level to engage individuals. Same way I said about the buses, we had to follow up specifically with each one of those families to designate that bus area, train them how to, where to get the day, all those things, and then we had to go back and make arrangements for them to get the immunization necessary with the family, and that's labor intensive. And that's sense, we only have one nurse in that program, because I keep looking back in the back room. Yeah, because I'm sure you have very young parents too. Correct. as well because I remember years ago title one had programs for parents mm -hmm. and one of them was how to have an effective parent conference some mm -hmm. of the basic things mm -hmm. uh, if you're okay, having right. a problem mm -hmm. um, with your child's teacher what do you do mm -hmm. or if your child comes home and tell you this what do you do I mean some of the basic mm -hmm. things that a lot of people take for granted that a lot of people may not know uh, give the teacher a chance you talk to the classroom teacher first right. before you call the principal right. or the superintendent or a board member. So I think this is, well, <laughs> Thank you. wonderful what Thank you're doing. You. And uh, I would like to hear more about it, like the, yeah. the classes you're going to teach, the, what are you gonna, the programs you're going to do to help these parents because it gives them a solid foundation on um, how to work well with the school system because maybe some of those parents didn't have a good experience right. with the school system. So. I think this is great, and it's six days that you can do this. Right. So I, I, I think that's... Well, you know, the other piece, too, Mrs. Washington, it's a, it's a wonderful conversation, and, and um, the, the piece is if we could ever get to the point where when a child is born, you know, we, we spend great time with them as soon as they're born about 
what needs to be done for a healthy lifestyle and a healthy advancement for the developmental and maturation process. I've always talked about the need for a prescription for the development of the mind, mm -hmm. what needs to occur. Not all parents are trained to be parents. You know, they're not all of a sudden, just because you have a child does not mean you're going to be an effective parent. We recognize that. We recognize the challenges that uh, individuals who uh, have less fortunate means, what that means for them and the struggles that they're going. At the same time, a child should not be uh, harmed or put in a position because of a family structure of which they're born into, uh, should they be disadvantaged. That's all bears out in the research. Uh, that bears out in terms of unequal childhoods, the book uh, by Annette LaRoe. Uh, and that's where it talks about the achievement gap starts at birth. And so all of these intentions, I'm very proud of this because it gets to that uh, actual one-on-one -on -one intervention and recognizes the challenges that the parents may have, we're going to them. We've built the time in, we value it, something you've advocated for for more parent liaisons, uh, and to acknowledge that. Those are the courageous conversations and putting those uh, actions in place. So I'm very proud of that, and I, I'm really so delighted that we're talking about that, because that's a huge uh, shift in our calendar that was brought up in part of our conversation about the inequity of the AMPM days on early dismissal days and how mm -hmm. we manage that. And then you add in the snow days and, I mean, all that stuff, <laughs> you know, so. And everything else. And everything else. So thanks for the Thank opportunity you. to talk about that. Thank, Thank you. you. This is really interesting and cutting edge. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's great. It is. I really appreciate that you have addressed the inequity. It's, it's the question I ask you every year. Why are we doing this? What can we do to make sure these students um, are, are um, given every opportunity. And I think that what you've proposed um, is an excellent way to address that. And, um, and I, so I appreciate the out of the box thinking. And I know that this is a proposal and that it's something that you will obviously be fleshing out over the rest of this school year, school and, year. and into the next. And so um, I would echo Mrs. Washington's request that um, perhaps sometime after the start of school mm -hmm. next year, that as you have those plans um, mm -hmm. more fully developed, that um, you might bring those forward to us, either through an information item or, or a board update, um, because I would like to know more about it as well. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, and lastly, uh, to your point about the um, ongoing discussion about when to start school, I think your comment about the fact that it's sort of like whack-a-mole, if you do something here right. or something over here pops up, I think what we need to continue to stress to our delegation and um, is that uh, we have eight days of school prior to Labor Day. If we take those off of the front end, mm -hmm. they have to go somewhere. And so I, I sat here as the discussions were going on and I looked at the end of the calendar. That would mean, if this were to pass, um, that our students would be in school until Friday, June 26th. Right. So, um, and when you, when you take into account when our various assessments are done, and those are set often by the college board um, or by the state or by the feds, um, those are typically given, you know, earlier in the spring. So you're talking about much less, you're, you're talking about losing eight significant days of instruction. Yes, and, you um, are. and I just, I understand where they're going with it, but I think it just reflects the fact that they truly do not understand the, um, what we function under. And you, you, can't take, you can't move off of one end without impacting the other end. So thank you for all you, the work you did on this. Um, I know that once you put in all the must-haves, the rest of it just sort of plays itself out. And um, it is a function of when Christmas and New Year's fall this year that um, provide us the once in a while uh, longer winter break. 
um, I guess that's the time the superintendent's going to put word out that that's, that's when we need to be wearing our pajamas inside out and backwards. So if we want snow, it needs to come from White Christmas. Exactly. <laughs> May I, Dr. Raspa, I know we're looking at time, but Mrs. Mrs. Allen brings yes. up a great point. Um, Angela, I'm going to ask uh, that you make certain that your charter school is following the work regarding the post-Labor Day. I advocated on your behalf about our charter school, mm -hmm. but as it stands now, uh, there was no recognition of a variance based upon the fact of a charter school designation. So I said, I've got a very unique model that I've tried to advance for the total community to embrace for our school system that addresses the summer regression, the summer gap, keeps kids in school longer, uh, in terms of, I should say, in terms of engagement, uh, talked intently about that. and. Um, was concerned. I would ask your network to tune in. I was uh, early morning greeted by an email where I was asked to provide more information about the, how would it look and very clearly stated what Mrs. Allen said, you only have so many options and that would push it into June and I need to put the school system and the community on notice. It starts very clearly tinkering with things that we put in at the issue of the local control. That's why we're advocating for local control because I would immediately have to recommend to this board that we could not go to June 26 at that level because of other things that we have. So we have to start looking at spring break, other ish things that we've put in that we know, compressing different breaks, looking at our professional development, all those things that are valuable to what makes our system work. And that was the advocacy level uh, promoted. It was tinkering with local control because we all have unique variables. Mm -hmm. And so I want you all just to sort of tune into that as this conversation is occurring, but the movement up front is to move this to after Labor Day. And uh, there is one chapter in the book of, called Outliers on page 250, mm -hmm. uh, talks about the KIPP school and a study out of Johns Hopkins that refutes that whole notion and talks about more time, uh, extending school years, longer days, et cetera, uh, and at the same time valuing the need for downtime with family, et cetera. But it all can be balanced out, particularly when you're talking about these issues in total. So I asked the charter school to tune into that and relevantly look at that. Thank you. I'm quiet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Monroe. Dr. Rigel, thank you very much. As usual, great job. Uh, Mrs. Hall, uh, thank you for the input. And Mrs. Uh, Pilcoin, thank you very, very much. And uh, I remember years and years ago, I used to chair that committee. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it might be easier if he told we, us what he hadn't done in the school system. <laughs> and once, once I got through, I don't advocate, Dr. Rigel, that you, you proceed with this, but I thought many a time it was time for me to go see a psychiatrist. Oh, it's a wonderful <laughs> group of people. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, future board yeah. meetings, the public budget hearing on the FY 2015 operating budget will be held on Wednesday, February the 5th, 2014, at 6 p.m. here in this room. And the next regular board meeting will be held on Wednesday, February the 12th, 2014, at 9 a.m. This meeting is adjourned.